58 in requesting a formal apology from our Pope. As my dear friend, former Kahnawake Chief Christine Zachary Diome wrote me, Canada is now coming to grips with the reality of truth. It is difficult to bear when we know there's more bad stuff to come, yet our forgiveness is always ready. Better not to hide behind lies. The road to reconciliation is hard, Mr. Speaker, but we must all undertake the journey together. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon University. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The residents of Saskatoon University, in fact, all of Saskatchewan, not to mention the rest of Canada, are deeply concerned about what we're hearing regarding this government's new censorship bill. We live in an increasingly digital world and one at risk to the influence of bad actors such as this power-hungry, unaccountable government. I've heard from many people telling me they don't trust this regime with these powers over what they can see and hear and don't believe Ottawa should have the, the power to decide which posts will be seen and which ones will be buried. And personally, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I can't blame them. Now we have the Liberals censoring their censorship bill. We've seen the script in other countries that this Prime Minister has expressed his love for, and we don't want to see him here. The Conservatives are the only party that will keep Canada free and scrap C-10. The Honourable Member for Brampton East. Mr. Speaker, I am delighted to address the House today as we mark over 1 million doses being administered in the region of Peel. I'm incredibly proud of how far we have come, and this would not have been possible without so many on the front lines. I want to take a moment to appreciate the healthcare heroes who have cared for our loved ones in their most vulnerable moments. They courageously stepped up in our time of need and have sacrificed so much in order to care for our community. There are countless healthcare heroes who have contributed to Team Canada's pandemic efforts. Among them, Dr. Gutterwell, Dr. Anand, and the entire team who have been working nonstop with testing and vaccination at Embassy Grand in Brampton East. The courageous team at Brampton Civic Hospital, some of the heroes among so many include Priya Hearn, Andrea and Alex Hall, Bindu Patel, Nicole Speed, Jennifer Shields, Mary Woodward, Candice Barone, Darce Tucker, and all the way from Newfoundland, Michelle Murphy. As we look to brighter days ahead, please continue reminding your family and friends to get vaccinated. Let's do our part to crush COVID-19. The Honourable Member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Mr. Speaker, last week the United Nations reported that since the start of the conflict in Tigray, Ethiopia, over 2 million people have been internally displaced. Rape and sexual violence have become widespread and systematic. Civilians, human rights defenders, journalists, and aid workers have been arbitrarily detained, beaten, and killed. Starvation related to deaths have begun and will accelerate exponentially without immediate intervention. Canada's $37 million commitment to the region is critical, but if Eritrean and non-regional military forces continue impeding aid from Tigray, this assistance helps no one. The international community must work together to demand an immediate withdrawal of Eritrean and non-regional forces from Tigray and seek unfettered humanitarian access to the region, including support for survivors of sexual violence. I reiterate my call for an independent international investigation into gross violations of human rights and humanitarian law by all parties as a critical starting point to ensuring accountability, peace, and security in the region. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Caribou, Prince George. Mr. Speaker, last week I met with a local child care worker named Christian. Christian shared with me how devastating COVID has been on the children he cares for, how he struggles to provide important daily necessities for these children, and how that has negatively impacted the children's mental health, well-being, and self-esteem. Christian didn't know who to turn to. That night, Kelly and I were trying to figure out a solution to his problem. So the next day I made a number of calls. One included a call to tell us. Mr. Speaker, TELUS has a motto, give where they live. Since 2006, TELUS has just di distributed more than 165,000 kits for kids across Canada. This year, they're handing out 14,000 backpacks stuffed with school supplies for young people in need. TELUS volunteers donate over a million plus hours every year. Over 1.3 billion has been donated by the TELUS members uh, and retirees since 2000. Their social purpose truly is at the heart of everything they do. And Mr. Speaker, last week when I made the urgent call for help, TELUS answered. Local TELUS and their volunteers stepped in and collected emergency supplies for 60 at-risk youth in my riding. I want to personally thank TELUS for answering the call. You are truly 
building better future for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country. The National. The United Nations declared this decade as the Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Research on uh, ocean science is conducted all across this country to increase our understanding of marine environments and uh, biodiversity. Ocean science lays uh, a framework for understanding uh, uh, the oceans, and we invite Canadians to participate in this uh, dialogue. On this World Ocean Day, I'd like to celebrate uh, the work done by river, uh, river keepers, uh, the Pacific Science uh, Centre, and all of the uh, contributors to the ocean health and how sound. I also want to thank the Salish people, and particularly the Squamish Nation, who have uh, been guardians of these oceans since time Im immemorial. For foothills. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, it is not fair to ask to, for others to do what you are not willing to do yourself. It is the pillar of true leadership. But unfortunately, our Prime Minister is running a deficit on budgets, trust and leadership. He has lost that trust because he believes there's one set of rules for Canadians, but a special set of rules for him and his friends. The Prime Minister has chosen to travel internationally when he has asked every other Canadian not to do so. And when he returns from the G7, he will bypass a designated hotel quarantine program he has imposed on everyone else. No, there's a special set of accommodations for the Prime Minister, and Canadian taxpayers will be footing the bill. This is the epitome of Liberal entitlement. The Special Advisory Council on uh, COVID-19 has recommended that the hotel quarantine program be scrapped. Subsidized hotels where women are sexually assaulted and dozens of others have lost their jobs. Canadians are sick and tired of paying for liberal pandemic failures. End the hotel quarantine program now. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Uh, uh, the the uh, Okay, the Honourable Member for Eastman, um, Selkirk, Interlake Eastman. Selkirk Interlake Eastman. My apologies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Liberal members on the Standing Committee of National Defence have been shamefully obstructing our committee from completing the study into sexual misconduct allegations in the Canadian Armed Forces. The Defence Committee has been stuck in the same meeting since May 21st with Liberals speaking ad nauseum and the chair needlessly suspending the meeting. Yesterday, the Liberals even went so far as to filibuster their own amendment. That is the level of des desperation they're taking to block a report from ever seeing the light of day. While they filibuster with their long-winded speeches to ensure Canadians never see a final report into this Liberal cover-up, they are disrespectfully and unfairly quoting survivors of military sexual misconduct. This is the height of hypocrisy. This cheap political grandstanding is dis disappointing and reflects just how little regard the Liberals have for our troops. This scornful obstructionism by the Liberals has to stop. Time is running out. If they truly care for the victims of military sexual trauma, the Liberals would immediately allow a vote on my motion that will speed up the passage of our report and recommendations. Anything less is an insult to our brave women and men in uniform. Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, today is World Oceans Day in celebration of our oceans and in solidarity with those who commit to rescuing them from the threats of climate change, plastics pollution, habitat destruction, and a failure to consider the whole ecosystem in our resource management practices. Current policies and practices of this government undervalue the importance of stewardship and restoration of our marine environment and the critical importance of reversing global warming and acidification of the oceans, renewable energy, and the 
loss of or degradation of fish stocks, habitat, and biodiversity. The government's blue economy policy does not address the role of the ocean regulating the climate by sequestering CO2 and producing uh, oxygen, and it fails to recognize the importance of wind farms and other scientifically proven effective forms of renewable energy. Canada clearly needs to do better for our oceans. I call on all members of this House and all Canadians to commit to protecting the wonder of the ocean and as our life source, supporting humankind and all other organisms on Mother Earth. Happy World Oceans Day to all. The Honourable Member for Beauport, Côte de Beaupré, Ile d'Orléans, Charlevoix. Mr. Speaker, the Quebec documentary Les Roses, or The Roses, by director of Félix Rose, the son of Paul Rose, was recently awarded the People's Choice Award at the Quebec Cinema Gala. Although it wasn't initially nominated, thanks to petitions, letters, and its exceptional box office success, Quebec Cinema finally nominated it. This historically accurate, unvarnished, clear-eyed film was a huge success. And this award shows once again just how much this period of our history has marked Quebecers. Felix Rose offers his father's view of the tumultuous period surrounding the October crisis, reminding us of the vital importance of documentary film in Quebec culture. From Pierre Perrault's Pour la suite du monde, to Denis Arcon's movie Le Confort et l'indifférence, to Les Roses, documentary film in Quebec helps define us and tell our stories. On behalf of the Bloc Québécois, for its courage, audacity, congratulations, Felix Rose. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, on Sunday evening, a Muslim family in London left their house to do what so many families regularly do during this pandemic, is to go on a family walk. But because of a brutal terrorist attack, a six-year-old boy, the only survivor of this senseless attack, is without his mother, his father, his sister, and grandmother. This is the latest chapter of a horrifying increase in Islamophobic attacks, including the Quebec City Massacre and the murder at the IMO Mosque in Toronto. This type of vile and extreme hatred is an affront to Canada's values and has no place in our country, but it is a reality that Canadians must face and address immediately. To the family and loved ones of the victims, I want to express my deepest condolences during this unbelievably difficult time. Mr. Speaker, we stand with the Muslim community and reaffirm our commitment to building a country that is free from hatred, where Canadians of all faiths can live without the fear of violence and persecution. Thank you. Member for London West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I'm rising to draw attention to a deplorable act of hate that rocked my community of London West on Sunday evening. A Muslim family, a mother, father, two children, and a grandmother were out for a walk. A driver mowed them down. Four people are dead, and a little boy, now with no parents, is in hospital. But this was no accident. This was a premeditated attack on a family because of their race and religion. It was a hate crime. The suspected perpetrator has been caught, but nothing can fill the gaping hole left in our community. Muslim Canadians are afraid, and no Canadian should fear for their life because of who they are. We must stand up to all forms of hate, including Islamophobia. We must speak up and fight acts of terror and make no mistake, this is an act of terror. I hope this chamber will join me in denouncing hate in all its forms and in committing to combat the extremism and racism that leads to such horrific events as unfolded in London on Sunday night. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions. Question oral. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are mourning with our Muslim community and with the City of London today. As a mother and a grandmother, I just cannot conceive of the horror of having my family run down as we went for a walk simply because of our religion and our race. How does this happen in Canada? But our mourning must lead to action. Can the government update us as to what's being made available to London's Muslim community and to the city to deal with this tragedy? 
The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and we all join with members of this House in condemning the terrible crime that took place and expressing our heartfelt sorry for those taken from us, for their family, and from their, for their community. But let me be very clear, Mr. Speaker. This terrible crime was an act of hatred and of terror. And while the nation grieves, we must also acknowledge that many of our fellow Canadians live in fear. Hatred and intolerance exists in Canada and is an unacceptable part of the lived experience of far too many Muslim Canadians. Mr. Speaker, today we stand in solidarity and sor sorrow with the Muslim community. But we'll let us all deepen our resolve to take action, to end hatred, intolerance and fear, and to be the inclusive country we aspire to be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the minister for that answer. Mr. Speaker, the Canada-China Committee twice ordered for the documents to be made public relating to the firing of the two scientists from the lab in Winnipeg. The government refused. The House ordered the documents last week. The Liberals are again refusing and are blatantly defying the orders of this House. What is the Liberal government so eager to cover up that it's willing to be found in contempt of the House of Commons? The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I will point out that these documents have been turned over to the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. This multi-partisan committee will now be able to review the documents in a secure fashion. And of course, um, we support the committee in that review. The Honourable Leader, our Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, that was not the order of this House. That order was to present those documents to the House of Commons and to be made public. The two scientists in question transferred two of the deadliest diseases in the world to the Wuhan Institute of Virology in March of 2019. That lab is now the subject of an American investigation into the origins of COVID-19. It also was the subject of numerous questions posed by the U.S. State Department regarding how it handled the virus strain. So I ask again, what what is our Canadian government so desperately to cover up regarding what happened at the lab in Winnipeg that they are prepared to be in contempt of the House of Commons? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, yet again, we see the opposite, trying to conflate the situation with the origins of COVID-19. And indeed, the director of the lab has indicated that this is in no way connected to COVID-19, which, as you know, arose much time later. The National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians is the appropriate committee to review these documents. They have the ability to review these documents in a secure manner, something all Canadians expect. L'honorable député de the Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. What happened a few months and years ago at the National Micro Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg is very important and very serious for our national security. That's why the House last week passed an order asking the government to release essential documents so that we can know exactly what happened. Unfortunately, the government refused once again and instead sent the documents to its own National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. It's so secret we don't even know what was sent. When will the Prime Minister table the documents as ordered by the House? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, that member opposite knows that the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians is a multi-partisan committee with representation from both houses, Mr. Speaker. This committee has the ability to review these documents in a secure manner in a way that all Canadians expect. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, the Minister knows full well that that committee, the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, is not a parliamentary committee as such. It's the Prime Minister's personal committee. He's the one, the Prime Minister, who ultimately decides whether or not he wants to disclose the information. He's the one who decides whether or not recommendations will be made public. The Prime Minister has full control over that committee. It is not a parliamentary committee. And, Mr. Speaker, once again, the question is quite simple for the Prime Minister. Why is he refusing to release the documents as the House of Commons has ordered him to do? The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, yet again, I will remind the member opposite that, in fact, the Conservative Party can nominate who should sit on the National Security Intelligence Committee, Committee of Parliamentarians. This committee exists to be able to review documents of a sensitive nature, of a secure nature. This multi-partisan uh, by-house committee will now be able to review these documents in a secure manner in a way that all Canadians expect. The Honourable Member for St. Jean. Mr. Speaker, right now, one in two small and medium-sized businesses is turning down contracts because of a labour shortage. And there's no way to bring in temporary foreign workers because of delays in Ottawa. The minister shouldn't blame the pandemic. Back in 2019, the bloc complained that delays in processing applications from Quebec had more than doubled. Back in 2019, the bloc accused Ottawa of being asleep at the switch, as Quebec has repeated this spring. Because nothing is moving, what is the minister doing to solve the perennial problems causing delays every year with the arrival of temporary foreign workers, thereby putting our SMEs at risk? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I work closely with my Quebec counterparts on this file and many others. Over 34,000 foreign workers have already arrived in Canada for the 2021 agricultural season, and including over 14,000 who have arrived in Quebec. The results speak for themselves, and we are continuing to do the work we need to do to support Quebec's economic recovery. The Honourable Member for berthier masquinonger Mr. Speaker, quote, there are more and more applications for temporary foreign workers every year, and every year the government feigns surprise and apologizes for not being ready. Summer comes at the same time every year, and so do the harvests. Mr. Speaker, these were the bloc's criticisms of the federal government in February 2019, well before the pandemic, and it makes me mad to have to ask the same question again. What is the minister going to do today to ensure our farmers are not able are not only able to recruit workers, but that they arrive before the crops rot in the fields? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, here are the facts. Our government has doubled the number of foreign workers in Quebec from 11,000 in 2015 to 23,000 in 2019. Despite the pandemic, we have welcomed the largest number of temporary foreign workers of all times last year, and we will receive even more this year. We will always work with the government of Quebec to support their economic recovery. And Powell River. Mr. Speaker, genocide against Indigenous people is part of our country today. That is what happens when a government is asking itself, how much does a childhood cost? When a government asks itself, do survivors like those from St. Anne's have the right to information on their own torture? When someone does not stand up and say yes, then they are saying no. Yesterday in this House, 271 members voted unanimously in favour of an NDP motion in honour of 215 children who didn't vote says something. How can Canadians believe Liberals want real reconciliation? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the motion highlighted fundamental values of our government, including the need to continue to make concrete progress on implementing the calls to action, compensating survivors of historic child and family welfare system inequities, and supporting the healing of St. Anne's residential school survivors. It also included aspects on complex legal matters in, involving jurisdiction and privacy rights, which require extensive collaboration with Indigenous peoples and cannot, nor should they, be resolved unilaterally uh, on the floor of the Parliament of Canada in a non-binding motion. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. The toxic legal battle between the Minister of Indigenous Crown Resources against the St. Anne's survivors uh, from the survivors of the residential school has been a stain on the promise of reconciliation. It is time to do the right thing. Yesterday, Parliament ordered the Minister to cease and to desist and to sit down and negotiate a just settlement with the St. Anne's survivors who come from a horrific institution of torture and pain. Even the Liberal backbenchers are calling on her to act. I've seen the letter that the survivors sent the minister this morning saying that they're ready to meet. Will she call the St. Anne survivors and agree to work in good faith to finally put this matter to rest? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the mistreatment of Indigenous children, including those uh, who attended St. Anne's Indian Residential School, 
is indeed a tragic and shameful part of Canada's history. To restore the confidence, rebuild trust, and maintain the integrity of the process, the court has ordered an independent third-party review of Sinan's claimants to determine if additional compensation is owing to the survivors. The court has designated Justice Ian Pitfield to conduct the independent review, and steps are underway for that process. Canada will fund additional health support measures for all the survivors throughout the review. The Honourable Member for Sukhthudami Lafjord. Mr. Speaker, the housing situation in the country is dire. Prices continue to rise beyond what Canadians can afford. Large cities are particularly hard hit. According to the Financial Post, in Montreal, 23,000 people are on a waiting list for social housing, and many units are in poor condition due to government budget constraints. In addition, half of Montreal's 21,000 social housing units are substandard. Why doesn't the government have, have a plan for housing in Canada? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know that every Canadian deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. We have a long-term plan to make sure that every Canadian has stable housing that is critical for the growth of communities and a strong middle class. That's why Budget 2021, the fifth consecutive budget, which has more investments in affordable housing in the two, to the tune of $2.5 billion, uh, is set to repair and support 35,000 more affordable housing units. We have also introduced Canada's first national tax on vacant or underused residential property owned by foreign non-residents. This will help families, young people, low-income Canadians, and people experiencing homelessness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Shakurami Lefjord. Mr. Speaker, current government policy doesn't do enough to simulate housing supply. The government's first-time home buyer incentive has been a flop. On top of that, foreign buyers are investing heavily in our real estate, driving up prices unnecessarily. The current plans aren't working. When will the government start developing a new plan to address these problems? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's very rich for the uh, party opposite to talk about affordable housing. When they were in government, they spent only $250 million per year through, uh, for affordable housing. Meanwhile, we have invested over $27 billion since coming into office and have committed a further $72.5 billion under the national housing strategy. And now we are... Uh, and now they're opposing our budget, which includes even more investments into housing. So this is a party that has absolutely no credibility when it comes to affordable housing, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Shakurami Lefjord. Mr. Speaker, there are still many challenges that lead to the housing problems we face. We need tax incentives to increase the number of rental units on the market. Money laundering laws need to be strengthened, and housing policy in general needs to be redefined to increase the supply of housing. Canadians need solutions. Why hasn't the government acted on any of these options? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as the numbers show in the National Housing Strategy Report table recently, we've helped over 200,000 families get the housing that they need through building new homes, repairing existing ones, and providing affordability support. Since 2015, our government has supported the creation of nearly 100,000 new affordable housing units. We have repaired over 300,000 more across uh, different housing programs, representing over 27 $0.4 billion of investments. Uh, we have absolutely no lessons to take from a party that completely ignored affordable housing in all its years in power, and we're not stopping there. Budget 2021 plans to invest an additional $2.5 billion and reallocate further investments to repair... Honourable Member for Mission, Matsky Fraser Canyon. Mr. Speaker, this member, the, the, the member that just spoke, is misleading the House. In, in Budget 2006, the Conservatives actually invested $800 million in affordable housing, $450 million for uh, housing on reserve, and $300 million for uh, urban Indigenous Canadians. So he should stop misleading the House. Now, to my question, today the Parliamentary Secretary said the National Housing Strategy addresses the entire housing continuum. 
If this is truly the case, was it the intention of the government to drive home prices out of reach for the average middle-class Canadian? Exactly. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member is entitled to his opinions but is not entitled to his own facts. The fact of the matter is the former Harper government spent only $250 million per year on affordable housing. Meanwhile, we've invested over $27 billion in affordable housing solutions since coming into office. And we've committed to spend a further $70 billion under the national housing strategy. They ignored this problem. They did not invest in reaching home. They didn't uh, have a, a plan to invest in more rental stock in the market. They didn't support people through the Canada Housing Benefit, which we introduced. We have no lessons to take from the Conservatives on this issue. The Honourable Member for Mission Maskey Fraser Canyon. Well, Mr. Speaker, a generation of young Canadians are being cut out of the housing market. Housing has become unaffordable. There's not enough supply. Money laundering goes unprosecuted. Offshore speculators inflate prices, and the Liberals continue to fail first-time home buyers. Will this government take a concrete and action plan and address the supply problem challenging first-time home buyers and those seeking to own their own home in Canada? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we introduced the first time home buyer incentive to help uh, first time home buyers in Canada achieve their, their dream of home ownership. Do you know what the Conservative Party's record for helping first time home buyers is, Mr. Speaker? It is virtually non existent. During their time in office, the only policy that they could come up with on that side of the House was to provide a $750 dollars in tax credit for first-time home buyers. Meanwhile, we are expanding the first-time home buyer incentive to enhance eligibility in the greater Toronto area, the greater Vancouver area and Victoria by raising the qualifying income threshold to $150,000. We are making sure that more and more Canadians have... The Honourable Member for Mission, Metzke Fraser Canyon. Again, Mr. Speaker, the member is misleading the House. For the first time home buyers program, the government said it was going to help 200,000 Canadians. It's helped 10,600 in two years. What a joke. The Aboriginal Housing Management Association CEO, Margaret Foe, stated that over 25 years in the Indigenous housing sector, she's never been as shocked or as disappointed as she was upon reading the recent budget. With the tabling of Huma's report, Indigenous Housing, The Direction Home, will the Minister fulfil his promise or will the Liberals continue to ignore the 87% of Canada's Indigenous people living in urban areas? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, no relationship is more important to our government than the one with Indigenous peoples. Just recently, we announced that almost 40% of all the units created under the Rapid Housing Initiative will be targeted to support Indigenous peoples, including those in urban areas, something that the Honourable Member fails to mention. In addition to that, 630. $8 million have been allocated specifically to housing that benefits Indigenous peoples living in urban, rural and northern communities. Once again, Mr. Speaker, if you look closely and you scratch beneath the surface, the Conservatives did absolutely nothing to provide affordable housing solutions for Indigenous peoples in urban and rural and northern communities, Mr. Speaker. No, no. The Honourable Member for Avignon, Amitié, Matan Matafedia. Mr. Speaker, on April 22nd, Ottawa announced new greenhouse gas reduction targets of between 40 and 45 percent by 2030. That same day, the government promised me in this House that it would include this target in Bill C-12. This is not true. The government has not included its 2030 target in C-12. Worse yet, it's fighting the Bloc Québécois to prevent us from doing so. They're stopping us from amending the bill. The government chose the target. I would imagine they think they can meet it, so why refuse to enshrine it in law? The Honourable Minister. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would remind my colleague that our government proposed an, an amendment at committee to include Canada's target in the legal text of the bill. I would remind her also that she voted along with the Conservative Party to try to reject that important amendment. It's clear that the Bloc is saying one thing publicly and doing quite the opposite in committee. The Honourable Member for Hoponsigny. 
Yesterday, the parliamentary secretary told me the government was open to amendments and happy to have the bloc members on board. That's not quite what the minister's saying now. That wasn't true. The bloc is trying to amend C-12 to include the government's climate change targets for 2030, the government's own targets, and the government is fighting us tooth and nail to stop us. There's no opening. There's a wall. Again, the government itself set those targets. So why are they so afraid of putting them into law if they have every intention of meeting them, if they have any intention of meeting them? The Honourable Minister. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said, we moved an amendment to include Canada's targets into the bill. I'm very sad to see the Bloc Québécois trying to stop the progress of the committee, all the things they did. If we're to have C-12 to fight climate change, we hope the Bloc will uh, assist us in that endeavor. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint charles Mr. Speaker, yesterday at the Health Committee, we heard damning testimony that hotels under contract for the federal hotel quarantine program were simul simultaneously using the pandemic to lay off workers. 70% of those workers are women, people of color, and new Canadians. The Prime Minister has funded this quarantine program without thinking about the details and the men and women affected by it. What's going to be done for those who've lost their jobs? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. I'm sorry. Uh, I failed to unmute myself, Mr. Speaker. Uh, every step of the way, we've been there for Canadians to protect them from the risk of international travel, to work with partners across the country to ensure that the measures and layers of protection are indeed doing their job. And Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to do that. We know that reduced mobility is a way to protect the importation of virus, and we'll continue to use science and evidence to guide our way. No, no, the Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint charles Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the Minister obviously didn't understand the question. I have another one for her. After weeks of receiving and ignoring a report from a panel of experts outlining how to ease federal border restrictions, the Finance Minister last week scoffed at the idea of easing restrictions for people who had been vaccinated. Today, the Prime Minister, under pressure from the media, said requirements could be relaxed for the fully vaccinated. Is the Prime Minister going to jump the queue for his second dose to avoid the mandatory quarantine? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, we have been informed by science and evidence as we have uh, added layers of protection at the border. We thank the panel, the testing and screening panel, for the roadmap forward on how to manage international travel and also protect Canadians from the importation of the virus. We will continue to be guided by science and evidence to ensure that as Canada opens up, as the international community opens up, we do so in a way that is safe and protects Canada from uh, for other waves of COVID-19. Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Yesterday, the Health Committee heard that the Prime Minister is using his unscientific and unsafe hotel quarantine program to discriminate against women and persons of colour. An overwhelming amount of Pacific Gateway's long-term workers are women and persons of colour, but were laid off under the auspices of this program in order to hire lower-paid workers. They've now filed a human rights complaint. Will the Minister immediately stop using hotel companies who discriminate against women and persons of colour and union bus to run these unsafe programs? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for the question, and we are aware of the ongoing dispute between the Pacific Gateway Hotel and Unite Here Local 40. Our government believes and has faith in the collective bargaining process. We encourage both parties to work together to resolve issues, to reach an agreement. However, this is a provincial matter and falls with under, under provincial jurisdiction. Thank you. Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Except it's the federal government that is paying Pacific Gateway to run an unsafe, unscientific hotel program that's allowing for these abuses. At these hotels, there's been worker abuse, COVID-19 outbreaks, and sexual assaults, and yet the government persists in propping it up. But the Prime Minister himself won't stay at one of these facilities, and to me, that says it all. 
there's no evidence to keep these programs going and workers are being abused. Will the minister commit to immediately scrapping the hotel quarantine program? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I have said, that this matter falls under provincial jurisdiction. But let me share with you what we have done as a government in order to support unions and workers from the time we were elected. In 2015, one of the first measures we implemented was Bill C-4, which repealed Bills 525 and 377, which were actually anti-union pieces of legislation. We've been there for workers. Look at the enhancements we've made under the Labour Code, increasing leaves, creating new leaves. We have been there and we will continue to be there for workers every step of the way. The Honourable Member for Rosemount Petite Patrie. The Liberals have never been champions of the fight against tax evasion. They always wanted to protect the interests of their ultra rich friends taking advantage of the system. The latest budget proposed a beneficial owner's registry, but it's still too little. The parliamentary budget officer is holding the government's feet to the fire and reminding it that it still hasn't done enough. Uh, we are being robbed of billions of dollars. It's time to take action. When will the minister stop closing our eyes to the KPMGs of this world and really tackle tax havens and tax evasion? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The agent has committed to ensuring that all taxpayers pay their part and respect their tax commitments. Uh, historic investments by our government have given the tools to the agency that it needed to improve its data analysis. Uh, and I would tell the member opposite that the number of audits is not directly related to the cases of uh, noncompliance. In other words, the agency is conducting targeted uh, audits that are giving good results. Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, Alberta's United Conservative government has opened up the Rocky Mountains for new coal mines. Fences, roads and drill sites are going up in areas designated as critical habitat for species at risk. Benga Mining has applied to the mine to mine the Grassy Mountains site without a plan for controlling selenium pollution and more new mines that avoid federal oversight are being pitched to investors. This will have devastating effects on our environment and we need immediate action. Will the minister commit to protecting the Rockies and Eastern Slopes from these new coal mines that will destroy our mountains and water for generations to come? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we certainly have understand and, and have con heard the concerns of many in Alberta with respect to the eastern slopes and, and other areas that, uh, that are uh, opened up for uh, prospective mining. Certainly in the context of, uh, of assessing those, that is exactly why we put into place the Impact Assessment Act to ensure that we are assessing in a thoughtful way uh, all environmental impacts. I would agree with my colleague that the issues around selenium discharge are extremely important and they are something that we are working on very actively with respect to coal mining effluent regulations. And we, we want to ensure that any projects are environmentally sustainable on a go forward basis. The Honourable Member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For many generations, the conservation efforts of Indigenous guardians have been essential to protecting our environment for future generations. When it comes to protecting and respecting our lands and waters, all of us have a lot to learn from Indigenous people's traditional knowledges and experiences. Can the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change share with us how the the, with this house, how the Indigenous Guardians pilot will help us reach our land and water protection targets while working towards reconciliation. Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the member for Newmarket Aurora for his question and his advocacy in this important area. The Indigenous Guardians pilot recognizes the many lessons that can be learned from Indigenous partners across the country and relies on Indigenous ex experience and traditional knowledge to ensure lands and waters are protected for generations to come. Just last week, we announced funding for 10 new initiatives under the Indigenous Guardians pilot. These initiatives will enable First Nations to monitor ecological health, maintain cultural sites and protect sensitive areas and species while creating jobs. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to supporting Indigenous leadership and conservation to protect ecosystems, species, and culture for future generations. Member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, last week the Conservatives sent the Prime Minister a letter seeking action for the 215 children found at the Kamloops Residential School and for the many more who still need to be found. 
Families and residential school survivors want answers, and so far, all they are getting from the Prime Minister is platitudes, rhetoric, and abstentions. Will the Prime Minister commit to developing a comprehensive plan to implement truth and reconciliation calls to action 71 through 76 by July 1st? The Honourable Minister. I thank the member for the question, and as we know, all Canadians have been heartbroken as we learned of the remains of the children at the former Kamloops Residential School. We are working with the community and our partners. I, I had a very important conversation with Kopke Kashmir last evening, and who is working to provide the resources and supports needed as determined by the community. We are reaching out now uh, to, uh, to Indigenous communities across Canada as to how su to support them in finding their lost children, as outlined in those TRC, very important calls to action, including how they can access the $27 million of funding made available on an urgent basis. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Speaker, yesterday the Minister for Crown Indigenous Relations said 80% of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendations were met or were in the process of being met. According to the Yellowhead Institute's latest report, only a dozen of the calls to action have been completed. It's been over five years since the report was finalized and only 13% have been addressed. So I asked the Minister again, when will the government finally complete the remaining 87%? The Honourable Minister. Well, I thank the member for the question, and I want to correct um, the the report card that he has given. In that, it really is that this this the TRC roadmap for reconciliation is so important um, to our government, and in in objective reviews, 80% of the 76 calls to action under the sole or shared responsibility of the federal government are completed. Or of C5 is an example of concrete. Pro progress, C8, C15 coming soon. This work will require sustained and consistent action to advance Canada's shared journey of healing and reconciliation. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Minnapur. Mr. Speaker, yesterday we learned for the second time this week this government gave money to an organization, taxpayer funds, that were used for executive compensation. What? NAV Canada laid off 700 workers, increased airline fees by 30 percent, yet gave out $7 million in executive bonuses. Will this Prime Minister do the responsible thing, ask for Canadians' money back, and demand that these executives give the money back to yes. the government? Yes. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, with sincere respect for the Honourable Member, she knows that when we developed the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, we did so in order to protect jobs, and I'm pleased to share that in excess of 5 million Canadians were kept on payroll as a result of that program. Recently, we made an adaptation to that program to ensure that if a company increases executive compensation next year compared to before the pandemic, they'll actually need to pay that back. But before she criticizes us too harshly, I'd ask her to take a look in the mirror because her entire caucus voted against the measure we put in place to raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% so we, can, so we could cut them for the middle class. Canadians know that our government has been there for them from the very beginning, and we will do whatever it takes as long as it takes to get them through this public health emergency. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Skyview. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government's hotel quarantine program has been a failure from the start. It seems that even the Prime Minister knows this, as he refuses to undergo the process that his government has mandated for every other person arriving in Canada. Canadians were outraged when they heard about an alleged sexual assault taking place at a quarantine hotel. And now it seems that these facilities are laying off their workers, 70% of which are women. Mr. Speaker, when will this government admit their program is a failure and protect Canadians by scrapping it? Yeah. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have some of the strongest border measures in the world to protect Canadians from the importation of COVID and its variants. And Mr. Speaker, we will continue to use science and evidence to guide us on our evolving stance on the borders. It is incredibly important that we continue to make progress on immunization of Canadians, that we work with provinces and territories to ensure they have health care capacity to test, to trace. We'll continue, Mr. Speaker, to be guided by evidence and science as as we uh, as we uh, as we manage the border thank you the honorable member for Jean-Pierre 
Mr. Speaker, the United States announced that they intended to double softwood lumber tariffs. The Quebec forestry sector is yet again in danger. Obviously, we expect the federal government to take a stand. It's urgent to diversify the market starting here. The federal government can take action for the forests, and they can immediately implement a procurement policy promoting lumber. It can support research and secondary and tertiary processing. It can promote innovative forestry products. The Bloc has provided the government with a turnkey plan. Will it finally do something? The Honorable Minister. Merci beaucoup, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Let's be very clear. These uh, duties are unjustified and undermine uh, workers and countries on both sides of the border. The minister raised this issue directly with President Biden as well as with the ambassador. Our government continues to pressure to ensure the negotiation of a friendly settlement, but we will defend our industry, our forestry industry at all costs, including if need be through the dispute uh, resolution mechanism with uh, NAFTA. The Honorable Member for Jean Kier, the government can take action with the United States, but it can also support the forestry sector. The forestry sector represents 16,000 jobs in Quebec. The federal government does its part, but uh, like always with the federal government, it's the oil that gets all the grease. Just this year, Ottawa invested $560 million uh, to help oil companies pollute a little less. Uh, that's without taking into consideration all the subsidies and loans they hand out to fossil fuels. In the meantime, nothing for Quebec forests while the Americans increase their threats against our lumber. What will it take for this government to take action to help our forests? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, last week I had a discussion with the Canadian Association, which has a, a positive view of biofuels. We will invest $1.5 to in the fund to support biofuels and workers in the forestry sector to promote a clean energy future and to lead us to net zero emissions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Housing prices in the greater Vancouver area are among the highest in North America because of non-resident foreign buyers, money laundering, the failed liberal first-time home buyer program, and a lack of affordable housing. Middle-class families in my riding feel it every day. A young family in Port Moody is saving up for the first down payment by living at a parent's home, but skyrocketing prices are shutting them completely out of the competition. Their children will have to grow up far away from the grandparents in another city. When will the government stop crushing dreams and fix the housing crisis with real solutions? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as part of the National Housing Strategy, we introduced the first-time home buyer incentive, which will help families achieve their dream of home ownership by lowering monthly mortgage payments without increasing down payments. We are actually expanding the, the first-time home buyer incentive to enhance eligibility in Toronto, Vancouver, and Victoria by raising the qualifying income threshold to $150,000. Mr. Speaker, the party opposite, when they were in office, all they could do was provide $750 in a credit for first time home buyers. We are doing way more than that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Langley Aldergrove. If a young family in my riding of Langley Aldergrove decided a year ago to save up a little longer for a down payment on their first home purchase, Today, they are $150,000 further behind. In the words of one of my constituents, it is so hard to be hopeful anymore. BC's Lower Mainland is ground zero for Canada's housing affordability crisis, and people want to know what is this government's plan to tackle inflation and to keep the dream of home ownership alive. Bravo. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it is important to invest in programs that put home ownership within the reach of more middle class families and young Canadians. And that's exactly what we've done. Our first time home buyer incentive is putting more home ownership opportunities within reach of more young Canadians. And we're building on our historic commitments to giving more Canadians a safe and affordable place to call home. But what did the Conservative Party do when they were in office if they care about this issue? The only policy that they could come up with in nine years of government was a $750 tax tax credit for first-time home buyers. That is miserly, Mr. Speaker, and we have done way more than them in a very short period of time. Merci beaucoup. The Honourable Member for Stevenson, Richmond East. 
Mr. Speaker, in my home of Richmond, house prices are now up 20% in the past pandemic year, averaging at $1.5 million. Richmond has become the epic center of housing challenges in the GVRD and Canada. We would benefit from well-developed policies on affordability and supply. What will the government do to make affordable housing project approvals have funds accessible faster and in a more transparent manner? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, for a party that claims to care about supply, all they could come up with to spend on affordable housing solutions is a mere $250 million a year across Canada. We, are invest, we have invested over $27 billion in the national housing strategy since we've come into office. We know that every Canadian deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. Our plan is building on a strong foundation. That is why Budget 2021, for example, is the fifth consecutive budget that puts more money in affordable housing to the tune of $2.5 billion. We're also reallocating $1.3 billion in existing funding to speed up the construction, repair or support of 30... The Honourable Deputy... The Honourable Member for dorval uh, la Salle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This past year has been difficult for all Canadians, but the pandemic has hit women disproportionately harder in Quebec, we are seeing a devastating increase in the number of violent incidents. 11 women tragically lost their lives. Can the Minister of Women, Gender Equality and Rural Economic Development uh, give us an update on the ways that our government is preventing gender-based violence and supporting women survivors in Quebec? Thank you. The Honourable Minister. Share my solidarity and condolences with Muslims in London and across the country, particularly my hijabi sisters who are feeling terror and who are feeling targeted. Comme les actes islamophobes, chaque vie perdue. Every life lost to femicide, just like when we talk about Muslims, is one too much. We think of all those who are affected by these terrible acts. Since we have formed the government, we have been there to fight against gender-based violence, and we will continue to do so. 50 partners in Quebec for their hard work will continue to be there for you. Honourable Member for Aurora, Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, Canada has a housing crisis, and this government has failed to act. In my riding and the GTA, housing prices are up by 25% in the last year, with the average household cost now over 33% higher than the rest of Canada. Money laundering is extensively exploited in Canadian real estate, leaving many properties vacant. And in Toronto alone, approximately 40% of condos are vacant, driving all prices up. Will the government support our opposition day motion and urgently act to address Canada's national housing crisis. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the party opposite has absolutely no credibility on this subject. They spent $250 million a year for the whole country on affordable housing. We have spent over $27 billion in our national housing strategy, and there's more to come. Budget 2021 is the fifth consecutive budget where we're spending more money on affordable housing solutions for Canadians. We are, in, we are introducing a tax on vacant homes owned by non-resident, non-Canadian uh, real estate owners. We have introduced the Canada Housing benefit. I could keep going, Mr. Speaker, but the party opposite has absolutely no shame on this issue because they have no credibility and no lessons to give us, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dufferin Caledon. Mr. Speaker, I've heard the Minister's talking points today and I can tell you the plan they have isn't working. Housing prices are continuing to surge and it's an ongoing problem. The dream of home ownership for young Canadians is being killed. And those who do find a way to buy a house are being crippled with massive debt burdens. Criticizing what a government may or may not have done six or seven years ago is not actually a plan. What new steps, new steps is the government going to do to deal with this housing crisis? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, you know what doesn't help first-time homebuyers? A mere credit of $750. 
That's a joke, Mr. Speaker. What we have introduced is the first-time homebuyer incentive, which reduces mortgage payments by helping first-time homebuyers with their down payment, as well as we've increased it recently to make sure that it works for uh, Canadian uh, first-time homebuyers in Vancouver, Toronto, and Victoria, as well as raising the minimum household income. That is real solutions to ensure that Canadians have access to their dream home, home ownership. The party opposite has absolutely no credibility on this issue. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government's promised rapid housing initiatives have been anything but rapid. This government has spent billions of taxpayers' dollars on housing, yet families in Edmonton are struggling to secure a roof. The first-time home, home buyer program is a failure. The removal of regulatory barriers, incentives for municipalities to increase density, and leadership that can resolve a trade dispute is what we need. Mr. Speaker, how many families in my riding unable to buy or rent a home will it take for the Prime, Prime Minister to finally capitalize on NGOs and the private sector's ability to help housing? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, only a Conservative would claim that a program that has ensured that 40 percent of that $1 billion rapid housing initiative delivering real housing solutions for Indigenous communities is a failure. Only a Conservative would claim that uh, housing that is being built in less than 12 months is not rapid. We, are, we have exceeded our target of 3,000 affordable housing units under the Rapid Housing Initiative. We are on track to actually build 4,777 permanent housing units. And in fact, we've increased funding for the Rapid Housing Initiative to the tune of $1.5 billion, resulting in a total of 9,200 affordable housing units, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam. Mr. Speaker, my constituents in Coquitlam, poor Coquitlam, are watching the steep decline of wild salmon in our region with great concern. This impacts my community, thousands of workers in rural and coastal communities, and the hundreds of indigenous communities in British Columbia that fish salmon for food, social, and ceremonial reasons. Preserving and restoring our Pacific salmon is fundamental to ensuring that the Pacific coast has salmon for generations to come and my community expects our government to act. What is the government doing to protect this exceptional species? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam, for the excellent question and for his advocacy on this file. I'm pleased to announce that through Budget 2021, our government is investing $647 million, and today we launched the Pacific Salmon Strategy Initiative. This strategy represents the largest ever government investment in efforts to save Pacific salmon and is aimed at stopping the declines now while helping to rebuild populations over the longer term. We'll be working closely with Indigenous communities, harvesters, industry, environmental organizations and provincial and territorial partners to advance actions under each pillar to stabilize the species and to support a more modern, sustainable and economically resilient sector. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenai. Mr. Speaker, during the last election, the Liberals vowed to introduce the Just Transition Act to give workers the training and support needed to succeed in the clean economy. Organizations such as the International Institute for Sustainable Development and Unifor are calling on the Liberals to keep their promise. The Minister says it's coming. With only two weeks left before we rise for the summer, will the Liberals introduce a Just Transition Act or is this just another empty promise? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I am fully committed to the mandate letter given to me by the Prime Minister. We are looking at all our options to support workers as we build a low emissions energy future, including legislation. No one gets left behind. Energy workers build this country. They are the same people who will lower emissions and build up renewables. They are the same people who will help us meet our targets. We're investing in them through budget 2021 with $2 billion to retrain and retool to the jobs tomorrow with investments in CCUS, low carbon fuels and hydrogen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kitchener, South Hespler. Mr. Speaker, despite ministerial policy directive requiring the CRTC to promote competition, affordability, consumer interest, and innovation in their telecommunications decision, the CRTC has fallen short to reduce prices charged by the big players to the smaller, more competitive 
uh, players in the telecom industry. Can the Honourable Minister explain what the government is willing to do to make these services more affordable for Canadians, especially at this time? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me thank the Honourable Member from Kitchener South Hespler for his question and his continued advocacy. Allow me to assure this chamber that our government has been relentless in promoting competition and improving the quality and coverage of telecom services across our country. We're fully committed to ensuring Canadians pay fair prices for mobile and wireless services, regardless of their postal code. Let me emphasize, we can't afford to leave anyone behind. We'll continue working with service providers to make telecommunication services more affordable for all. That's all the time we have for question period today. Rising on a point of order, the Honourable Member for Timmins James Bay and the Honourable Member for Timmins James Bay. Thank you so much, Speaker. I believe there have been consultations with other parties and if you seek it, I hope you will find unanimous consent for the following motion. That in light of the horrific discovery at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School, the House reiterates the call it made in the motion adopted on May 1st, 2018 and A, invite Pope Francis to participate in this journey with Canadians by responding to call to action 58 of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report and issue a formal papal apology for the role of the Canadian Catholic Church in the establishment, operations and abuses of the residential schools. B, calls on the Canadian Catholic Church to live up to their moral obligation and the spirit of the 2006 Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement and resume the best efforts to raise the full, of money, full amount of the agreed upon funds. And C, calls upon the Catholic entities that were involved in the running of the residential schools to make a consistent and sustained effort to turn over the relevant documents when called upon by survivors of residential schools, their families and scholars working to understand the full scope and horrors of the residential school system in the interests of truth and reconciliation. All those opposed to the honorable member moving the motion will please say nay. Nay. I'm afraid we don't have unanimous consent. Can we have a point of order, Chair? Uh, we have another point of order, but if it's on the same one, the Honourable Member for, for uh, Timmins James Bay is rising on a point of order? Yes, so I just want to make if sure... I, if I could just get the Honourable Member to just raise...